Hey, welcome Faithful Politics listeners and viewers. If you're watching on our YouTube channel, my name is Will Wright and I am your political host and I'm joined once again by the Honorable Pastor Josh Bertram. So welcome, you're Josh. here. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, and this week we have uh, George Weigel. Um, he is a um, senior fellow of the Ethics and Pu Public Policy Center. Um, and used to be the former president of the um, just said public policy center uh, where he led a wide ranging uh, discussion about ecum ecumenical um, and interreligious program of research and publication on foreign and domestic policy issues. And currently he is now uh, a senior fellow um, there. Um, and we are just ecstatic to have him here and bless us with his presence. Thank you. George. Thanks for having me, fellas. Good to be with you. Yeah, thanks. George, you're finally we have a we have a conservative that so I'm not so alone <laughs> that can come on the uh, show and uh, and have a good conversation. So I'm looking forward to that. Maybe I'll surprise <laughs> you a little bit. You probably will. <laughs> yeah. So 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 uh, I guess for for starters, uh, George, what what is what is the EPPC uh, primarily focus on, and what, and what kind of organization? The Ethics are they? And Public Policy Center has been in Washington for over 45 years now, uh, we're really the religion and society think tank in Washington. Washington has all sorts of think tanks, research institutes, generally of a certain ideological or philosophical profile. We're the only place that uh, really is about uh, religion and society, religiously informed moral argument about how to make our country a better place, how to make the world a better place. Um, we are Catholics, Protestants, and Jews. We are uh, men and women. Uh, most of us uh, would be considered uh, conservative or center-right. Um, uh, we were a divided house uh, during the last administration. Uh, we're not so divided during the present administration, uh, but um, we like we like okay. to think that we model uh, a serious, open-ended conversation. When I was running this place, uh, I insisted on having people from the left of the political spectrum involved in our programs because we don't get anywhere in just talking inside silos, and there's far too much of that in the United States today these days anyway. Yeah, you're, you're, you're so right. And, uh, you know, that, that, that definitely brings us to, to kind of our, our next question that, that Josh will, will I'm sure enjoy asking. And, and that's, that's regarding, you know, what, what does it mean to be a conservative now? I think it means to be someone who cherishes tradition, family traditions, national traditions, the best of them in any way, uh, someone who, uh, whose basic attitude towards creation, towards this country, the United States, uh, towards our fellow human beings is one of gratitude. Uh, conservatism, as I understand it, is a posture of gratitude towards, towards the world. It also is an understanding of the human condition, which believes that there are certain things built into the world, that this is not just a big free-for-all, uh, that, that freedom involves the true and the good, not just my will and what I want to do at any given moment. That's my two-and-a-half-year-old grandson's understanding of freedom, but that, that's not a mature understanding of freedom. Um, and I think uh, while there are certainly people of a conservative political disposition who are not religious believers, uh, I think all conservatives would understand that um, transcendent moral reference points, truths that are bigger than we are, ought to inform the way we lead our lives as individuals uh, and, and the way in which we form our communities. That makes a lot of sense. I, uh, I love that definition. 
and those thoughts about conservatism. And I find myself very much empathetic with what you're saying and, and, and seeing myself in that, in that line of thinking and line of reasoning. Uh, so we're thinking about the conservative party, especially particularly in America. And of course, conservatism and liberalism tend to change over time. You know, the conservatism, let's say, of the 18th or 17th centuries would be different than the conservatism of today. Maybe not, maybe not completely different, but significantly different, I, I would say, and, and for sure. Correct me as, as as you think it needs that. But my question is that um, with this shift, what shifts do you see in particular with the last uh, administration with Trump? What shifts do you see good and bad within the conservative party? And where, wh what do you or conservatism as a philosophical yeah. You know, yeah, I think you understand. Like, what, what do you see and, and, and where do you want it to go and where do you think it's going? Well, I'm not sure where anything is going these days, but um, I am I am not happy with the state of the Republican Party today. Um, in March 2016, uh, Professor Robbie George at Princeton and I, uh, along with some 30 other Catholic intellectuals, thinkers and writers, issued a call to our fellow Republicans saying, look, we understand you're unhappy, but Mr. Trump is not the vehicle with which to express your unhappiness. Uh, you saw how influential that was. Um, I guess what, what bothers me about a lot of this today uh, in the conservative world is its crankiness and its narrowness. Um, uh, the United, for just to take one example, I mean, we're, we're here talking on February, uh, whatever it is, what is it, February 27th. Uh, Mr. Putin has 120,000 troops surrounding Ukraine, a fledgling democracy, a place where I happen to have a lot of friends, uh, the site of an enormous amount of suffering in the 20th century, and no little bit of Christian martyrdom. You can see this icon of the Ukrainian Catholic martyrs of the 20th century uh, behind me here. For, for people uh, of, of a conservative disposition to say that, that Putin threatening to invade another country is none of our business is simply ridiculous. Uh, it's simply ridiculous. It's irresponsible. I think it's immoral. Uh, my colleague at EPPC, Fran Mayer, wrote today that it's morally obscene. Uh, and I think that's true. So this kind of America first, meaning America only, is both um, morally dubious and I think it's strategically idiotic. Uh, I mean, if you know anything about the history of the mid-20th century, you know where this kind of stuff gets you. Um, on the other side of the the ideological divide. Uh, I am very concerned that um, that American liberalism has simply lost touch with reality. Uh, there are truths built into the world and into us. Uh, we ignore those truths at our uh, peril. Um, and uh, while we should all have sympathy and compassion for people who are confused about their sexual identity or their uh, life circumstances or whatever, you can't remake reality uh, without trying, without doing real damage uh, to people's lives, people's relationships, uh, and so forth. Um, uh, I think while the conservative world often has a nostalgic false view, a nostalgically false view of, of American history. Um, the liberal world, particularly, you know, what we call the hard left, um, has a almost a demonic view of American history that, that just doesn't make sense. Um, so um, we got a lot of 
problems of, of national narrative or storyline or whatever you want to call it uh, to sort out here. Uh, but we're not going to sort them out by yelling at each other or by assuming that the person you're talking with um, is a person of bad faith. Yeah, you know, you, you know the on on your topic about um, truths, um, the you know, I, I I have a hard time kind of agreeing with you. Although I I definitely respect your 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 viewpoint because I I I understand you know maybe kind of some of the conservative viewpoints maybe about gender or about i don't know race or race not existing wh whatever the case may be whatever the issue is um but i but i'm wondering like like if if you think that truth is is something that can be unveiled through a better understanding of whatever that topic is like for instance i'll just take myself for example like i'm an african-american male you know i don't know like 200 years ago i probably wouldn't have been seen as much of a person that was sort of the universal truth at that time. Um, but we've, we've come, you know, to a better place, I believe in this country. And, you know, like I have rights and I have a job and I can vote. <laughs> so, so I, I'm curious if maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on, on that truth. Yeah. Part. Well, well, what I would say is that 200 years ago, uh, the situation in which you, you might've found yourself, um, would not have been the expression of the truth, but of the false. Um, and perfectly expressed, if dreadfully expressed, by Chief Justice Taney in the Dred Scott case when he says a black man, black man has no rights that a white man is, is bound to observe. I mean, that's not a truth. That's a falsehood. That's just you know, false. And uh, any biblical anthropology, since we're talking here about faith and politics, um, you know, should have led him to understand um, uh, the truth is, and let's take something quite controversial, and I'll try to say it in a calm way. The truth is there is absolutely no longitudinal evidence, evidence over time, that so-called sex reassignment surgeries lead to better mental health outcomes. No, zero. Um, and yet, because that ideology of gender recognizes no place where the ratchet stops, the ratchet has to keep going till personal willfulness asserts itself, as, as, as they would claim it must, ignores that empirical data. In the sake of, for the sake of ideology. Now, what is ideology? Ideology is the distortion of truth for the sake of some advantage, political, economic, or otherwise. Um, uh, uh, I'm a great admirer of Václav Havel, uh, the Czech dissident, playwright, later president of the country, right after the collapse of European communism who, along with Pope John Paul II, whose biography I had the privilege to write, um, spoke about living in the truth as the antidote to tyranny. I mean, go back to the 1980s in, in that part of the world, Czechoslovakia, Poland, wherever. The bad guys had all the guns. The, the bad guys had all the, had a monopoly on material and yet people of conscience have a power of their own. Uh, this was, in a sense, the American civil rights movement applied to Central and Eastern Europe. I mean, Dr. King believed, believed in truth power, too. My old friend Bayard Rustin, who organized the 1963 March on Washington, believed in, in truth power. Uh, now, interestingly enough, they both got some of that from Gandhi. Uh, but uh, whatever the source, um, there is a, a power of conviction linked to truth, not to willfulness, not to ideology, but linked to truth that can 
as the Lord himself said, for those of us who are Christians, move mountains. So we need to we need to get our wrap our heads around that. So. Hmm. Yeah, I love that. That's a really cool uh that's a really cool analogy. You know, as you as you were talking, I one of the things I was thinking about was this idea of certain you know, truths, as, as we were pointing out, you said part of conservatism is that there are certain things built into reality that we disregard or try to change at our own peril. Now, I agree with that and in principle, and I think I know what you're talking about when you say those truths, but this is kind of a two-part thing. The first thing is what 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 do you think are the most important, I think you alluded to one, the gender issues, but what are the most important truths that you think we're violating today and what let me put it this way so what does faith catholic faith protestant faith what is christian faith in particular but you could you could expand it out to judaism or or islam that share a lot of uh, uh, some similar beliefs um at least morally so what what does faith the role, what is the role of faith in your mind of defending the ideals of freedom and inalienable rights in our society? And, and let, let me just give a little bit more context. I was talking to a friend the other day, and we were talking about the gender issues of, of being able to, you know, um, to uh, the gender ideology right now and, and, and what's going to happen in the future and where we found ourselves and and he asked me, why do you think this has happened? And and I, you know, I was just answering off the cuff. And I said, well, I think one thing is that we have a rampant individualism that drives us. And now we have the technology to do things that no one could have dreamed of 200 years ago. Like, for instance, we have the technology for a same-sex couple to be able to implant an egg Either get it from someone and plant it into them, if they're a, um, a a lesbian couple, or be able to ask someone to take one of their sperms as a donor and implant it into a friend or, or or someone within the family, right, and have a child, right, where otherwise they wouldn't be able to do it anything like that naturally. And so, my question, like, just giving that sense, like, we have the technology that lets us make choices that nobody else has been able to make before. And our moral understanding is trying to figure that out. So again, bringing it back, what are those kind of truths that you think are at risk today um, and struggling today? And, and where do you see faith playing the role in defending freedom while not allowing it to run rampant and roughshod over over everything that we kind of hold dear. Um, about, I don't know, 15 years ago, um, I reread a book I hadn't read since high school, uh, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, um, uh, written before Watson and Crick had figured out the DNA double helix, which is the key to all modern genetics. Um, and while Huxley was not a great writer, frankly, he, that, the first chapter of that book should be required reading for everybody. It's about the, what is it called, the Central London Fertilization and something or other, Hatcher. And it's about a world of manufactured human beings. Um, and you know, as you remember from the book, the human beings are manufactured to certain standards. I mean, there are alphas who are the smart people who are going to run everything. And there's one poor group that are uh, referred to as epsilon minus semi morons, who are you know, basically <laughs> the hoplites or the slave labor or whatever. Um, that is not, I mean, that probably sounded completely crazy in early 1930s when Huxley wrote it, but it's exactly what's going on in, in many respects today. Um, 
And, uh, of course, this is an old temptation for human beings. The Greeks had the myth of Prometheus, right? Prometheus wants to, for all the right intentions, wants to remake the world. So he's going to steal fire from the gods. Well, that didn't work out terribly well. Um, Gender, the word gender, I never use. Uh, The word gender is a relatively modern invention. Uh, It it is ideologically loaded to the extreme. Uh, It signals that who we are is something really inside our heads rather than in the givenness of our of our persons and and that's a big problem um because it's frankly un, unreal uh what does faith bring to the table here i think most importantly it brings uh, or it should bring, often doesn't. Churches are not too good at this, unfortunately. Um, it should bring an idea of freedom that does not reduce our freedom to mere willfulness. The way hmm. I often explain this to people is, what's the difference between my beautiful two-and-a-half-year-old grandson, the youngest of my five grandchildren, banging on a piano, and Murray Pariah playing the piano, okay? Little John banging on the piano is simply exerting his will, okay? I want to bang on the piano, so I bang on the piano. It is not music. It's noise. And after a while, it gets to be extremely obnoxious. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, I understand. How do we get from there to a brilliant classical pianist like Murray Pariah? Well, you have to do these boring exercises that train your fingers and your mind to do certain things on the keyboard. I studied the piano for eight years. First book I ever wanted to burn in my life, possibly the only book I ever wanted to burn in my life, was this book of finger exercises called Scales, Chords, and Arpeggios. Dreadful thing. Anyway, but if you do that, if you learn those disciplines, you were eventually able to play the music you want, perhaps even create music on your own, uh, communicate with others. Freedom has to be mediated through disciplines if it's to be a genuinely human freedom. It's the same thing with learning a language. We all learned our first language by listening and talking and making a lot of mistakes. We all learn new languages best by, by doing that. But at some point, you've got to learn grammar and you have to learn vocabulary. Grammar and vocabulary are rules. They're guardrails, if you will, that allow you to actually communicate with others rather than just making babbly rules. So... That's, I think that's a biblical idea of freedom. Uh, I think, now, that's worked out philosophically by great thinkers and whatnot. It's, it's the difference between freedom as sheer indifference. Freedom is, can, is understood as, as a faculty of will that can attach itself legitimately to anything. And freedom as a gift, believers would say a gift from God that enables us to know the good and to choose the good as a matter of habit. And habit, or habitus in Latin, is the old word for virtue. So freedom and virtue uh, go together, and both right and left have forgotten this in the U.S. The right, it comes in a libertarian form, and the left, it comes in, I don't know what you want to call it, form. Um, uh, but it's a false idea of freedom. It, the founders linked the American claim to independent nationhood to certain truths built into us. And they got that idea both from Enlightenment philosophy and, I believe, from the Bible. 
Yeah, you know, George, what what I like about you is that I think I, I disagree with a lot of what you just said, <laughs> and that sounds weird, but but I like to I like to have my own sort of opinions and thoughts challenged, um, and you know, it's one of the reasons we have this podcast. Like I. I don't know. I probably agree with Josh maybe 20% of the time. Um, <laughs> but, but, um, but I'm curious on your thought because let, last week we interviewed, um, um, Guthrie grades, uh, Fitzsimmons. He fellow at the uh, center of American progress. Um, he specifically works in the faith and religion area. Um, and I asked him a question, the same question I'll ask you is, you know, so as a, conservative and a conservative of faith, are there areas that you think, um, you know, say progressive people of faith, you know, are, are there items where, where both groups can agree on something kind of for the common good um, in sort of the political sphere? Um, uh, just just to kind of give you what his answer was, he, he thought that there was a lot of consensus from both groups around immigration. Um, and thought that, you know, both groups of faith, both conservative and progressive can see eye to eye with a lot of the issues regarding faith. Uh, so I'm curious on what, what, what you think are some of the, you know, common themes, common problems that, that, uh, the two groups could, could see eye to eye on. Well, I would hope we could agree on, on religious freedom and, uh, the necessity of protecting rights of conscience and the rights of religious communities to, uh, uh, lead their lives as, as conscience uh, and faith dictates. Um, uh, I would hope we could agree that um, uh, sex trafficking of women and girls is the modern form of slavery, and we ought to be bending every effort as a country to do what we can to abolish it around the world. Um, um. I would hope we could agree that the United States should uh, do everything in its power to promote religious freedom abroad. I, I just had a long talk yesterday with a man from uh, a country in South Asia that I won't name, um, whose brother is uh, under indictment for violating that country's blasphemy laws. Um, and as you know, people have been killed around the world for violating so-called blasphemy laws. Um, I'm sorry, that's not the business of the state. Uh, that's just not the business of the state. When I when I hear some of these uh, so-called new national national conservatives talking about taking back the culture by reinstituting blasphemy anti blasphemy laws. I want to invite them to go spend three days in, you know, Islamabad or Lahore or, or uh, you know, Damascus these days and see if they still have still have the same uh, point of view. Uh, I think we should be able to agree on the imperative of retooling, uh, helping people, a lot of Americans to retool themselves so that they can actually prosper in a post-industrial economy. Um, uh, I would hope we could agree that the National Football League should improve its overtime rule. Um, yes. Uh, uh, there's a whole host of things that we could that we could be we could be working on, but the the politicization of everything. Um, is is a real obstacle to this, and I also, I mean, I would also say that the the, the breakdown of confidence or trust in any traditionally constituted thought, religious, civic, political, judicial, whatever, is a big problem. Is a big problem. Um, the the amount of of disinformation and just plain crap. Pardon me. I could have used the other. There goes our explicit <laughs> range. Jeez. There, 
for example, on the internet, on social media about COVID vaccines is unbelievable. And it's uh, the stoking of this distrust is a grave disservice to the public. And it's going to keep us in this mess and with relationship to the COVID business for probably far longer than we should have. Um, uh, the sowing of distrust in the uh, uh, electoral system by both sides, by Mr. Trump and now by Mr. Biden, uh, is deplorable. Uh, American elections have always been something of a free-for-all. My, my brother's roommate in, uh, no, one of the guys in his fraternity at Northwestern University, right north of Chicago, uh, claimed to be the only person who voted for George McGovern seven times in 1972. <laughs> this stuff's been going on for a while, right? But I think by any objective measure, our elections are freer and fairer than they have ever been. Uh, and the attempt to cast doubt upon their, the integrity of the result is um, is a real disservice to democracy. Um and it makes us look bad in the world. What I mean, what on mm. earth, so to speak, is Xi Jinping thinking, Vladimir yeah. Putin thinking, when yeah. when we're having a circular firing squad here in the United States? It's yeah, not yeah. good for anybody. No, it's really not. And I I, I totally understand what you're saying. I I was reading in one of your um, articles and I. I you talked about Christianity's effect on, um, and I don't remember it's particularly on America, but you had named several things that Christianity did. It brought about, um, you know, first for, you know, like an individualization of faith as opposed to the family um, component of faith. And that, that brought about this sense that we had rights and we had, you know, that we were actually individuals that could that could make choices and, and, and those kinds of things. And I, I was I was fascinated by the article and I, and I put a quote here. It's a little bit too long, probably to read. Um, but you were saying that the uh, that the Christian conviction has opened thus, he said, opened up the social space for what we now call civil society um, that uh, basically it set the groundwork. And I'm and I'm I'm interested as we're looking at this, like people saying this is a Christian nation, you know, um, and uh, or like you referred to people wanting to go back to anti blasphemy laws. I've seen certain uh, scholars that even recommended, yeah, I mean, going back to yeah, like the laws of Deuteronomy, and and uh, I mean, it's just amazing people being either hanged or. Or, you know, any kind of the punishments that might be there for, like you said, blasphemy. I've seen that. So I've seen that from scholars, um, one scholar in particular. And I'm wondering, like, when you're looking at this separate uh, for us Christian nationalism or, or maybe the the nationalism in the in the negative way, maybe some people are reacting against right now. This nationalism that would call, for instance, a marriage between church and state. Um Separate for that that Christian nationalism from the Christian influence that that was uh, meted out and, and created a, a a framework and a soil, so to speak, for our country to grow out of. In in the Catholic Church, in uh, prescribed daily prayer that all priests are obliged to say and. Some uh, and religious and, and religious men and women, nuns and brothers and so forth and vows. We read. We spent two weeks right after Christmas, for some reason, reading chunks of the Book of Deuteronomy. And and one of them recently is Moses saying that when you have a sacrifice, uh, the priest gets the jowls, the shoulder, and the stomach of the animal. And I, I emailed a friend of mine, a priest who's pastor in South Carolina, after Mass on Sunday. 
and said, you get the jowl, the shoulders, and the stomach today. <laughs> he said, every time we read that, I'm grateful for the new covenant and for modern meat processing. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, how did I get off on that? Um, I believe and have written extensively that the church's fundamental task is the formation of culture, not the management of the state. As the state is not competent to make theological judgments, I do not want the state adjudicating the theology of the Trinity in Christian. Mm -hmm. These guys can't even fix the potholes. You know, why, why are you mucking around with this stuff? By the same token, I don't want the church pretending to be an alternative state because it's not very good at it. You know, whether it was Calvin's Geneva or the papal states in the 19th century, we just don't do this stuff too well. Um, the church's function is to form the culture that shapes the people through, for example, a proper understanding of freedom, which we discussed a moment ago who can then make the machinery of a democratic political community and a free economy work. Those, those institutions of democratic politics and, and market economics, they are not machines that can run by themselves. It takes a certain mm. kind of people living certain virtues to make that machinery work so that what comes out the far end is human flourishing and social solidarity not misery and chaos. The church's task is to form the culture that can form the people who can operate the machinery towards those ends of the flourishing of the individual and social solidarity. So I am not, Christian nationalism is not something that I'm interested in. I, what I am interested in is free space for the Christian community and, and, and other religious communities to do their work of cultural and personal formation so that the flourishing of the individual and social solidarity uh, happens. Um, I understand the frustrations that are driving some of this uh, stuff, uh, but I think the prescriptions in the main are, are, are going to be worse than the illness. And um, uh, now, that having been said, um, we have got to come to grips with the fact that a lot of our culture is a toxic waste dump, that it does do damage to people. Um, I know a lot of people who work in campus ministries uh, around the country, and their description of um, the damage that pornography addiction does to not just young men, but now young women, is pretty devastating. And uh, I don't have an answer to that um, from a legal point. But I do know that unless you recognize that that's a problem, you're not going to really do anything uh, about it. Um, uh, I am a convinced pro-lifer, uh, but I understand that legal protection for the unborn has to be complemented by effective care for women in crisis pregnancies and for their children after they're born. I mean, this is a two-sided, uh, this is a two-sided uh, proposition. Um, and uh, those are some things that I would hope we could, you know, get some sort of consensus on. Um, but, um, you know, we'll see. We'll uh, see. Yeah, George. So, um, kind of switching gears a little bit. I, I we we touched on it er earlier, um, just briefly, but regarding Russia, um, you know. So we talk a lot about truth. I mean, there's one one truth, and there's a ton of 
Russian troops along the borders of Ukraine, you know, some alleging that they're doing training exercises and, you know, nobody really believes that. Uh, and, and, uh, and I'm, and I'd love to kind of get your thoughts because I know that you just wrote an article about it recently, um, about, you know, what's going on there. And maybe more importantly, like is, is Biden the right president for this moment? I mean, mind you, I'm the resident Democrat of the two, and I don't think he's the right person yeah, well, for this moment. Like He's the only president we got. Yeah, well, that's true. So <laughs> we've got to hope that they figure this out. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I have a, I, I wrote a piece of my Catholic press column Wednesday that I think you guys saw about some of the religious mm -hmm. yep. dimensions of this. Uh, in the January 28th Wall Street Journal, uh, I have an even more extensive discussion of how a false understanding of what happened when Christianity came to the Eastern Slavic peoples in the late first millennium is one of the drivers of this aggression, or at least one of the one of the things that uh, that Putin and others uh, used to attempt to legitimate it. Uh, the Russian view, or at least the view of many Russian Orthodox leaders, uh, certainly Putin's view, um, and probably a substantial number of the Russian people, is that what we call Russians today are the only legitimate heirs of the baptism of the Eastern Slavs in 988. That's just historical nonsense. First of all, that took place in what is now Ukraine, when Moscow was a forest with wolves and bears. So, I mean, that just doesn't make any sense to say we own this, even though it happened a thousand miles away. Uh, secondly, there are cultures, Ukrainian, Belarusian in particular, that have at least as strong a claim to be an heir of that baptism. Um, but somehow, Russian national identity has gotten caught up in this historico-theological claim, you know, that we're the gods who inherited this. Now, if that's true, then there really isn't a Ukrainian nation, or there isn't really a Belarusian nation. This is the point I'm making in this. Wall Street Journal argument on January 28th. So that underwrites Putin's nonsense that Ukraine is, is really, it's a fake nation. I mean, he begins to sound like Trump with all this fake talk. Um, and that, you know, serves to legitimate uh, aggression. Um, this is very, very sad. Russian Orthodoxy is an immensely rich body of spiritual and theological reflection. Some of the greatest Christian thinkers of the 20th century were Russians, um, uh, although largely Russians living outside Russia after the Russian Revolution. Um, but they drew on this patrimony, and they did not have this kind of cramped sense that, you know, this is mine and only mine. And, and therefore, you people who claim a piece of that heritage are, are, are not real, uh, are not real culturally, and therefore you cannot be real politically. So this is a real, I, I, one of the reasons I wrote this piece in the, in the Wall Street Journal is to try to signal to the policy world, as I tried to signal almost 20 years ago now in a book on jihadism, that you ignore, policymakers ignore religious and religious conviction and theological ideas at their peril. This is not the world of Richard Dawkins. That, that world does not exist. It exists for him and for a very small group of, of people, primarily in Western Europe and, and, and uh, North America. But the rest of the world is intensely religious and becoming more so, uh, especially in Africa, interestingly enough. This is something we could go off on, uh, maybe in a second uh, 
podcast. And I <laughs> the fact that Catholicism's biggest growth area in the world today is sub-Saharan Africa is just completely missing from most people's <laughs> mental landscape. And it's hmm. certainly missing from the strategic thinking that goes on. But let's, let's keep it in Europe. If you don't understand that these... Um, that a false story, a false theological and historical story, a false cultural story, can lead to bad political outcomes, then you just haven't been paying attention. I mean, part of what mm. Hitler sold the German people was that they had been stabbed in the back in 1918, and therefore, you know, me, and I'll fix this, and, and so forth. So, I mean, it's um, yeah. Do you do do you think Putin will actually uh, invade? I mean, uh, my my own personal opinion is that he he will because I mean, it, it, if if I were him, I think there's a lot of good history and precedent to show that like nobody's going to take any action, whether it's like Georgia or whether it's like. 2014 in Ukraine, you know, or, and, and I'm just thinking, you know, Biden was, you know, vice president for, you know, most of Georgia and Ukraine, and now he's the president. So, um, I mean, what's to stop him? Um, but, but what do you think? I, I frankly don't know, Will, and I'm not sure anybody does, including Mr. Putin. I think he's <laughs> pushing to see how far he gets and, and what, the, what the pushback is going to be at, at certain points. Um, the, the lack of seriousness about this from Germany in particular is, is very disturbing. Um, but it is not going to be a walkover if he goes in. Um, I've been to Ukraine several times. I have lots of friends there. Uh, they are not going to go quietly. And Putin may be risking his own regime. Because when those body bags start coming back uh, from Ukraine, uh, he's not going to be a popular fellow, although he has means of social control, whether social political control, they're pretty, pretty draconian, and he's quite skilled at murdering his enemies. Um, uh, I guess what, what I would take from all of this, from the point of view of a podcast that calls itself Faithful Politics, is that um, if people of faith need to know that history isn't over, uh, you know, history is going to continue, you know, Christians believe until the Lord returns in glory. And you can't ignore that. Yeah. You, you, you can't ignore that. And you can't drop out of it. Uh, because e either it'll come to get you or you, you will reduce yourself to this shriveled uh, little uh, point of self-absorption, which is not a good way to live. It's not a good way to live. No, I totally agree. You know, we have people from all sorts of different backgrounds listen to this. That's kind of, you know, to your point that you had made earlier, where you insist on liberal um, – uh, you know, people of liberal viewpoint being engaged in the conversations that you guys were having there. I mean, that's kind of what we've tried to accomplish with this podcast is having interviews from different people talking about, you know, very, very different, um, very different, you know, uh, philosophies of life and worldviews. And it's funny because Will was like, I agree with, you know, I disagree with a lot of what you just said. It's right in the last guy we interviewed, I disagree with so much stuff that he said. It was like almost just about everything. And now I'm agreeing with so much of what you said. It's, it's interesting. Uh, so much of what you said, I've agreed with. My question is, and, and this is kind of, I'm going to ask this question and Will has one more follow-up um, uh, before we uh, bring this to a close. But Mike, we have all this diversity of people. People on the on the um, spectrum of uh, of political, from left to right, people on the sexual orientation spectrum that listen and have been a part of the podcast, uh, religiously from atheists to 
um, a, a really, really evangelical to even now, as you said, Catholic. And um, I th- we've had other Catholics on the show as well, other uh, theologians. And my question is, um, what what do you want to say to our audience? What do you think is kind of the most important thing you would want to say to them as it pertains to where we are right now as a nation? Uh, I would say very briefly, uh, Josh, that, that we're, we're demeaning ourselves. Uh, we're not living as Americans should live. Um, we have become uh, excessively siloed and uh, polarized. Uh, and we're not, frankly, bringing our best people or inviting our best people into public life. Um, Part of what we're suffering from, frankly, is a lack of capacity in, in public life right now. And um, uh, when I talk to young people today, uh, I often say some of you have got to commit yourselves to the vocation of public service, whether not yet, not the career, but the vocation of public service, whether that's, you know, in in electoral politics or in civil service work or whatever. But if the only people getting into particularly electoral politics are the people with the biggest egos and the loudest voices, then uh, Houston, we've got a problem. So that's, those are some thoughts. Yeah, that, that, that's really good. So, well so my, my, uh, my last question for you, George, you know, we, we live in an interesting time for sure. Um, and we've got this global pandemic that just won't go away. It's killed hundreds of thousands of people, um, at least just in the United States alone. Um, you know, we've got Russian aggression on the border of Ukraine. We've got China potentially going to invade Taiwan after the Olympics, probably. Um, you know, we've got, you know, there, there's a lot of bad going on right. in the world. And you wrote a really, really awesome article, um, you know, uh, called no optimism, much hope. And, and I, and I, and I'm going to pose the, uh, the, the same question that you post to your friend, um, uh, where you asked, you know, give me, give me some good news. Like, well, what's, what's, what's something we can rejoice about? Um, I think the, I mean, I take, uh, immense, joy from the sacrifices that pro-life people working in crisis pregnancy centers make who are offering women in crisis something better than a technological fix. Um, I see an an awful, a deep, I would say an awfully deep, an awful lot, a deep store of compassion in in the United States. Um, uh, but we have somehow failed to translate that in, into public life, in, in, into politics. And um, uh, uh, that's something we got to figure out how to do. Um, I, I, I hope people t- still take joy and satisfaction in their families. Uh, we just had 13 people in the house over Christmas. But it's four of them six years old and up. I mean, awesome. it's, it's completely chaotic, but it was, it was <laughs> enormous fun. And, uh, you know, uh, if you can't find some happiness in that, then, you know, go suck on a lemon again or something. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I mean, with thank you. With with that said, thank you again, uh, George, so much. We really uh, appreciate you uh, spending some time with us, and I don't know, just dropping some knowledge um, on our conservative listeners. Um, so, but, you know, we, we were told for a while that our show was leaning a little left, and I. So I, I've made it my mission to find really strong conservative voices out there. So I'm glad that you're able to contribute your voice to the course of future conservative voices we hope to have in the program. Go to the eppc.org website and you will find 20 colleagues who will be here. <laughs> All right. That's well, well Thank you. Well, thanks, uh, thanks again, George. And uh, yeah, we will uh, see you guys all next week. Thanks so thank much. Thank you.